Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I am here from the circus, and I didn't realize you have a robotics background as well. Is that right? Well, that's really cool. We have to talk about robotics later. So yes, I'm a circus performer, a roboticist, and currently I am the co-founder and mad inventor at 2-Bit Circus. So I'm here from the circus, and we're in the track about kids and families. So I think it's worth mentioning that one huge production that we created is called the Steam Carnival. And the Steam Carnival was a carnival from the future. It was all about showing kids about science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We made giant carnival games made with common electronics, fabrication techniques. We brought these giant reimagined carnival games to uh, Pier 48 in San Francisco and to Long Beach in Los Angeles. And we put on, uh, in each city, a four-day event. Uh, but here's the magic behind the Steam Carnival. We pulled back the curtain on all these games and showed kids how they could make what we make. We inspired them to create their own games, to create their own things, and in the process, you know, discover the joy of science, technology, engineering, art, and math. That is almost completely irrelevant to the talk that I'm about to give you now. Because what I really want to talk about was another consequence of the Steam Carnival and of the other things we're working on, and that is physical play together in person. So in the last panel, y'all were talking about uh, uh, co-located multiplayer. Well, in some senses, I'm taking the, the cell phones out of that equation. I'm taking the digital out, and I'm replacing it with the physical. So look, what does it mean to have physical play together in person? Well, from two people to 2,000 people, obviously, it's very powerful to have people playing together. I don't have to tell you that because we're in a mobile games conference. Um, but uh, you, you, the thing about being in person, you want to be able to stare your competitor down. You want to be able to strategize with your collaborators. Right? Nothing beats the bandwidth of real life. Here's where I'm going to get myself in trouble here, because I feel like the world is kind of saturated with tiny buttons on little touch screens. And there's nothing as satisfying as smashing a giant illuminated button with the palm of your hand, using your arms as wings, or running around looking for clues. Now, running around looking for clues obviously was uh, an outlandish statement uh, until two weeks ago now. Everybody is running around looking for clues. Beside the point. So we're building stuff for your entire body. OK, let's talk about some of the things we built. I want to start by talking about escape rooms. Has anybody ever gone to an escape room? One, two, three. OK, good. No. I'm going to give a quick background on escape rooms. You walk into a room. This room may be done up to look like a dungeon. It might be a castle. It might be a crime scene. It might be a bank vault. And you open the door, and you're like, wow, this place is cool. What do I do in here? You only know one thing. You're going to be asked to escape the room. You don't know how you're going to do it, but in that moment, this room is filled with infinite possibility. The door locks behind you, and you imme immediately begin ransacking the place. You're looking for clues. You're solving puzzles. Some of the puzzles are really cool. Some of them are like crossword puzzles bolted to thrift store furniture. It's not all awesome, but it's great to run around with your friends solving puzzles together. It's great fun for the entire family. We've been building stuff like that since before there was a name for escape rooms. We built one called Vice. You were running around uh, rooms of an actual warehouse, big space, gathering clues. You brought the clues back to our warehouse. They unlocked special content in large, purpose-built arcade cabinets that we built. It was a lot of fun. But here's the thing about escape rooms and about our early work in this field. There's no replayability. You can't come back and do this again. Once you've solved the puzzle once, eh, what's the point? You know you're going to win the second time, so you don't bother. Also. Escape rooms are great because there's this frenetic search for clues. Everyone's running around, but there's no room for plot. There's no room for character development. And it's just that, that same steady high pace the entire time. So we wondered, what would it be like to inject some story? What would it be like to, to make a room that you just couldn't lose, but you would enjoy every moment of it for the same reasons that perhaps you enjoy an episode of television? Right? You watch a TV show, and it's not all about the final two seconds of the episode. It's about the pacing. It's about the story. So 
We're huge sci-fi fans. I, I loved your slide about your design inspirations. I would like to incorporate by reference all of Henry's design in inspirations and then your game as well. <laughs> I want to add that because what we created is Space Squad in Space. Space Squad in Space is a room. You walk into this room. This is not a mobile game. Your mobile devices are not involved in any way in this experience. You walk in and you are on the bridge of the Space Squad Endeavor. And the Space Squad Endeavor is comprised of bridge consoles. And all these bridge consoles have large buttons and knobs and dials and levers. There's, multi, there's a, a giant multiplayer table that people are standing around. I'm going to show you each of these devices in one second. And you walk in and you meet Carla, the disembodied brain. She wakes up and she introduces your first mission. Your first mission is to return an alien ambassador to her home planet. You need to get her shuttlecraft across the galaxy to her home planet to avoid starting an intergalactic war, always. This is what we actually built. This is the bridge of the Space Squad Endeavor. So Carla, the disembodied brain, she wakes up, she gives you your first mission, and thus begins a series of tutorial exercises. So one person is going to gravitate to each one of these consoles. Somebody's going to stand right here and like, I must be the captain because I'm standing at this one. Somebody else, of course, is standing over at this console going, this is definitely the captain. This is where the captain is. Two other people are like, we're really in charge of this ship over here. Everyone gravitates to a console and thus begins a series of sort of tutorial exercises. So, oh, there's Carla, our brain. Can you turn down the volume? On, can I turn down the volume? <laughs> okay, so first exercise, you got to get yourself out of the shuttle bay. So you, dri you press forward on the, on the control stick, you drive out of the shuttle bay, and you realize you're out of fuel. Somebody has to fuel up the vessel. First moment of cross-collaboration. Vessel's out of fuel, charge it up. Shields go down, charge them up. There's buttons to switch between the shields and the thrusters. In this first moment, people realize, oh, it's not just me operating this console. I'm not playing a video game. We're collaborating to fly this stupid thing, right? Our disembodied brain is constantly going haywire. She's having a really hard time of it. Every once in a while, her brain chemical levels get all messed up, and the entire team rushes over to restabilize her brain. Oxytocin, caffeine, alcohol levels, they all go haywire. You got to keep them in the, in the green zone. The Space Squad Endeavor is a clunker. Let's face it, it's just a clunker. Ship systems fail left and right, and periodically they will go down. Everyone rushes over to follow the on-screen instructions for how to bring this thing back to life. Now, these things don't happen in isolation. They happen in the ordinary course of your mission. So you thought you were getting through the asteroid field to save the alien ambassador whose shuttlecraft you accidentally ejected into the cold depths of space. Um, but life support just failed. What do you do? Everyone's running around doing something different. So the story elements come in as b between these vignettes, right? You're chasing after the uh, you're chasing after the ambassador shuttlecraft while simultaneously trying to avoid intergalactic war. The alien overlord keeps calling. You keep putting him on hold. He keeps calling. You put him on hold. He keeps calling. You put him on hold. Finally, you pick up. There's the alien ambassador. He happens to be a dog. I'm not quite sure why, but this guy is pretty fearsome. And the entire crew has to sort of figure out how they're going to respond. It's a, a bit of a, a conversation tree style interface. People gather around this six player uh, navigation system. And together they have to construct a valid path through the asteroids to, uh, to capture the alien ambassador ship. Now, the wonderful thing about this entire room is that it's episodic. Much like a television show, much like the Starship Enterprise, which was able to sustain like 70 seasons of television with nothing more than a single set, we can do the same thing. We're basically reusing all of these same elements. We're reusing the central console. We're using each one of these interactive pieces. There's also VR. We can add new worlds through VR. In this system, there's a VR booth. And in episode two, one of your crew is teleported down to the surface of a hostile alien planet and has to disarm an alien device before it destroys the entire galaxy. Did I mention the, the galaxy is always at risk? So through this medium of 
multiplayer collaborative physical play together, we're able to take all of these amazing technologies that we find in our phones, that we're finding in VR headsets, all the sort of cloud-based networked intelligence, and I'm gonna to get to that in one second. We're able to take all of these technologies and we're able to integrate them into fun stories that aren't all about super high-paced action all the time, but give you the opportunity to understand the story. Uh, in a previous incarnation of this, this one was called Cosmic Contagion, it was a, a journey through an abandoned science laboratory. The chief scientist has gone missing, and it's your job to reconstruct his final science experiment and uh, hopefully save the world. We had an augmented reality element to this in one of the rooms. You would walk in, and you would come face to face with the alien artifact. The alien artifact can be interacted with through the means of this augmented reality uh, uh, we called it the phenomenoscope, this, this screen that you would walk around the artifact. And through the lens of the phenomenoscope, you would see these mysterious aliens, alien symbols. It was a puzzle that you had to reconstruct. Uh, this is, uh, well, actually, this is just the, this is the president of Argentina wearing one of our VR, VR headsets. I picked this image not because of the president of Argentina, but because he appears to be on a hostile alien world. This is where we will send you. Now I want to talk about a different project that embodies the same sort of collaborative play together uh, message. This will repeat. Uh, I realize that we're in the family track here, but I do have to mention the existence of cocktail parties for a second. Because we collaborated with a Los Angeles theater group called Speakeasy Society to write a piece of interactive immersive theater, which is a combination cocktail party and auction. And you arrive at this event, and you are issued a device. Your device has two buttons, and it has an earpiece. You walk in, you put the earpiece in your ear, you press the OK button, and you're introduced to your handler, and you're introduced to your new identity. And this will be your identity for the duration of this piece of theater. You are not just an audience member. You're a participant. You're an actor. You're an active part of this show. And your handler is going to tell you who you are, tell you why you're there. And your job throughout the night will be to gather information, ask important questions, interact with both the other audience members and the live performers there that night. And by the end of the night, we'll have collectively told a story. We'll have put on a piece of theater for one another. Where that piece of theater winds up, you can't know ahead of time. But throughout, that voice in your ear is going to tell you who to talk to next, tells you uh, what information you should reveal, what information you should try and gather. That voice will ask you yes or no questions, which you'll answer through the means of those two buttons. Periodically, live actors will stand up. Uh, they'll get on stage. They'll reve reveal new pieces of the plot as the night goes on. We conducted this as a 24-person uh, test in our shop. We did a limited run of this. It went incredibly well. The joy of a project like this is being able to program human beings from across the room. It's a magical thing to have designed, by means of these handlers in people's ears, designed these conversations that are to be played out among the active participants of the show. You see two of them across the room. You press a button. They both go like this. And they launch into a conversation that you can remember from the programming. It's the most amazing thing. Now, this doesn't happen. These conversations don't happen by accident. We're tracking the physical location of every participant in space at all time using Bluetooth beacons uh, and using uh, RFID tags, uh, NRF tags, excuse me. So we know where people are. And so in accordance with the needs of the story at that point, we will trigger conversations between nearby people. And so these conversations will just start happening automatically. And people will make decisions about how they want the night to proceed. We learned some incredible, incredible stuff about the problems that we'll have to solve in building deeper forms of immersive theater in the future. So one thing is dealing with uncooperative or actively disruptive people. Even in a limited run of 24 people, someone thinks it's funny to troll. And so being able to classify trolls by their behavior and use behavioral economic techniques to be able to use uh, 
the techniques of MMORPGs to sort of identify those behaviors and undermine the activities of trolls it was so interesting. We actually got to play with some of that. Tracking every action that everyone did, hand tagging some of the data, so that later we can start to apply some machine learning to, to really learn how people behave in these environments, how they respond to their handlers, what they do, who they talk to, where they go. When instructed, what do they do, right? We need to be able to classify uh, participants in interactive theater events like this and be able to give them different instructions depending on how we believe they'll behave. So, giant games. I mentioned the Steam Carnival. Really, I'm up here to talk about collaborative play together, co-located play together. One thing that we learned at the Steam Carnival is that when you take simple little games and you make them huge, you make them multiplayer, you let people use their entire bodies to get into the game, they love it. It's an instant hit for kids and adults. This is Laser Asteroid. Uh, thinking back to your experience with regular asteroids as a kid, did you know that that game was played with a laser projector? We took that laser projector, much more powerful, illegal Chinese import laser projector, and mounted it on the ceiling pointed it down at the floor, told everyone not to look up. <laughs> no, it's totally safe. Um, and we projected the game of asteroids on the floor. We used the Microsoft Connect to track people's location, uh, track the location of the person in the rolling chair as they moved around on the floor. So as you move around, that ship is always right between your legs, right in front of you. As you turn, it turns. As you move, it moves. And then, to fire, you press a button on the phone, and it shoots uh, a laser beam or a missile, or whatever we choose to call that thing, at a passing asteroid, they blow up. Best part about this is that crowd. Everyone is screaming, behind you, behind you, turn around, turn around. It's such a participatory event for everybody involved. It's so much fun. You take games like this, you make them bigger, you change some of the simple rules, just changes the game. This is an extremely old picture of a game that's really worked well for us for many years. This is called the Hexacade. Hexacade is a six-person arcade table. We've taken very, very, very simple multiplayer games and we've put them in this form factor. And here's what happens. You show up to a party with one other person or you show up with two other people, but very seldom do you show up with six people. And now, you're standing around the Hexacade playing a competitive game of six-player Pong or whatever, there's plenty of games, you're playing these games against people you don't know. You're standing there, staring them in the face, trying to beat them. And when the game is over, doesn't matter who wins, you all hang out, you all go out for a drink. It's an instant friend maker, and as a result, we're integrating this, this sort of six-player multiplayer element into so many things we do. Uh, if you remember back to our uh, multiplayer spaceship, Space Squad, this table made an appearance. We just lifted it right out of that and dropped it into the middle of that room. This is a crazy game. I don't know what to call this. This was something that we brought to our Steam Carnival, and it's a bunch of paddles that people can pick up and hold and move around. That red paddle that that gentleman is holding is controlling the red line on the wall. So he tips it back and forth. That red line moves back and forth. Balls are falling from the ceiling into those buckets moving back and forth on the ground. The balls appear there because little kids picked up rubber balls and threw them against the wall. And every time you throw a, a ball against the wall, a ball appears in the physics simulation on the wall. So you have kids just going pow, pow, pow. All day long, they're throwing balls against this wall, creating virtual balls, which then fall down into those little buckets. Those buckets are for points. If you see the guy in the plaid shirt, there on the right, he's got a giant wheel. And he's spinning this wheel left and right to move those buckets to catch as many point-giving balls as he possibly can. And everyone's on the same team. Everyone is working to the same end. Everyone wants the same high score. In fact, we didn't reset the high score all day. We didn't reset the score to zero all day. We just let it get higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And as kids would get tired, they'd walk away. And as adult, adults would get tired, they'd walk away. But everyone would step in and just keep making that score go higher and higher. It was so much fun. That six-player Hexacade, uh, this is its bigger brother. This is that game, all of those same mini-games, 
played with three foot diameter plastic spheres. Uh, when I talk about using your entire body to play a game, this is what I mean. Because that, that mouse, that trackball is this big. And you can play it with your stomach. You can play it with your hands. You can lift your kid up and he can play it with his feet. And there's so many opportunities, so many different ways to play this kind of game. To watch the incredible variety of people playing, some people are just like diving over it to make a, to, to, to make a pass. Some people are walking on top of it. It's great. So that's a little bit of what we do. Um, I realize that I've been over the, all over the map, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to let me talk about what we're doing. All right, does anybody have a question? So, thanks, Eric, that was great. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the story theater, if you will, the interactive sure. story theater, have you given any thought to whether and how that could work for mobile? or you know, truly mass audience as opposed to 24 people, like 2,400 people or 2 million people. Is, sure. is there a way to, to do that? So having had a career in the mobile games business, I've gone in the other direction. And now I scale from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, and up to 1,000 or 2,000. I haven't put much thought into the ways that we can take those experiences and make them available to, to mass market mobile, mobile game audiences. Because I feel like I, I did that thinking in my last, my last incarnation. I'm trying to make physical, co-located, uh, uh, play together, in-person games for, I'd say, up to 2,000 people. But when it comes to 2,000 people, you know, we have a solution for that too. And that is our stage show product. And it's basically taking a room like this and turning it into a massively multiplayer game. I'll stand up here, I'll point cameras at the audience. Under your seat you'll find cards with uh, red and blue on the back. You can vote. There's live projected games that happen on stage. Uh, we invite people up on stage, let them play Pong using slide whistles as the controllers. Um, we encourage everyone to pull out their phones. Oh, here we go. I brought phones into it. We encourage everyone to bring out their phones in the middle of the audience and play a game that we call WikiFight. And a WikiFight is a race a race across Wikipedia, played with everybody else in the audience. You basically visit our own hosted version of Wikipedia, and you're challenged to get from um, the wiki page for chocolate-covered bacon to the wiki page for Kevin Bacon, using only interwiki links. It's a race through the internet as fast as you possibly can. Uh, it turns out we learned something very interesting. Um, Every, uh, on average, any two pages on Wikipedia are linked by no more than four links. It does not make this easy. It's a ton of fun for like people in an audience. And we've tested it on huge groups. We've tested it on a thousand people at a time, and it's very fun. Games on the scale of, of the mobile games, you know, downloads on the App Store, not what I'm thinking about right now. So everything you talked about is really exciting, exactly what I want to do. How can we make that kind of thing happen locally. Is this something that you're going to be like setting things up in different cities? Is this just you're doing it for fun and just really enjoying inventing and you're just going to do it and not worry about it? But like, what if people want this? How can you give it to them? I want it. <laughs> Bring it to Vancouver, damn it. <laughs> so at, though, though this may sound like a crazy mad inventor's dream, and to some extent it is, uh, it is a business. And we have brought this stuff nationwide. Uh, the story rooms I've been talking about, we've tested them up here in the Bay Area. We currently have one running in Los Angeles. As you might expect, scaling anything that is designed for anywhere between two to 2,000 people, it doesn't go everywhere, everywhere simultaneously. Right? It, has to, it has to grow. It has to find adoption in the places that people go because building facilities is expensive. You have to rely on you know, finding the people where they are. Uh, being in the Bay Area, you're more likely to run into the games that we build because we do bring things up here quite often. We ran our Steam Carnival here at the end of last year, and we're likely to bring more, uh, more tests up here in the future. We're currently working on making something a little bit more permanent in Los Angeles that people can visit whenever they want. Um, on that note, do you guys do you ever partner with you know, Exploratorium, OMSI, any of those or, you know, hands-on kids and, and adult museums that really get into a lot of this too? It seems, seems like a natural 
through, through the medium of the Steam Carnival, we certainly did yeah. quite a bit of that. I mean, our, our audience and the audiences of uh, science museums and hands-on workplaces for workspaces for kids and adults alike, uh, those audience obviously align very well. So we've done quite a bit of that. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, Eric. That was fascinating. Thank you. Very thank much. you.